Hey there, Zlatko here. Welcome to What Is My Brain podcast. Thanks for tuning in. I get the opportunity to chat with fellow founders and business operators about their journey and how they got to where they are now, where they are going and how they're going to get there. I'm planning on bringing guests and touching on topics such as running multiple businesses, executing ideas, and just spitballing about random topics and current events. It's a casual conversation, and that will hopefully bring value to anyone that decides to listen. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for tuning in. Cool. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Mic check. All right. Gabby and Shannon, thank you so much for being on. I really, really appreciate it. I was really looking forward to this. And uh, yeah, I I just want to let you guys know that um, it's been awesome to see you guys grow. I was actually like even right before this on the website and looking at everything. And I think you guys have made some amazing upgrades to the the platform overall and to everything that you guys are doing. And um, so I want to give you guys the floor, make a quick introduction about yourselves, talk about whatever you'd like to talk about, and then we can kind of kick off with some of the nitty gritty stuff. I'd love to. And thank you again so much for having us. We're so excited to have the chat um, and it's been great working with you and your team. My name is Gabby. I founded the company in 2020 in the midst of COVID. It was a catastrophe happening in the world and we decided to start a company, which definitely makes a ton of sense looking back at it. <laughs> what a world when it's been and then we are so blessed to have been able to expand the team since then we now have a real office and a real group of people and one of the stars that we have uh that recently joined us now maybe six months ago or so yeah about that shannon um, <laughs> hi everyone z thank you so much for having us this has uh, been a long time coming so i'm so excited to be here um i'm shannon i am the marketing director here at smarter um and as you mentioned earlier, it's, it has been a whirlwind, but in the absolute best way. Um, there's a there's a, a lot brewing here at Smarter, and I'm excited to kind of jump in and talk about subscriptions today. I love it. I love it. Um, so tell me, what was what made you guys start a, a subscription company in the midst of the pandemic with all of the stuff going on? And I mean, again, looking back on it, probably the perfect time because everyone was going online. But at the time, I'm sure you were like, oh, shit, what did I do? <laughs> Yeah, no, that pretty much summarizes it. Um, <laughs> I was super fortunate. I spent four years at my last company, which was in prop tech, and I loved everything about the team and the environment that we worked in. But when COVID hit, it felt like we were um, kind of st- stuck in this commercial real estate space selling a product to Fortune 500 companies while small businesses were really struggling. And so my kind of like motivation in that role started to slip a bit, nothing about the company, like they were really awesome, but just was ready for a new venture. Um, And I started off by just chatting with founders initially as a favor to someone and learning about the pain points in e-com. And I literally thought someone jinxed me because um, pranked me because literally every person that I spoke to said that subscriptions were their biggest pain point. It wasn't even necessarily what we were talking about. I was just like, how's your e-com business going? Mm-hmm. Supply is really off right now. Like, how are you combating COVID with your D2C site? How are you selling on Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. And subscriptions just kept coming up. And my background being in sales, I was like, ding, 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 let's try to solve this problem. Um, it seemed innocent enough at the time, but little did I know it would be a long venture ahead but definitely the yeah. best the best type of venture i love it i love it now let me ask you did you previously have any expertise or uh experience like building a company or did you just kind of just dive into it knowing that like hey i'm just gonna have to figure this whole thing out yeah that was pretty much what we went through yeah. and honestly we were super fortunate i had a great group of early um, investors and peers that we had the opportunity to work with. We had really, really great support from so many people in the e-com space. And that's what I always tell people that are starting companies now, whether it's a D2C product or in tech, e-com is by far the friendliest like ecosystem that I have worked with. Commercial real estate was so competitive. No one wanted to help each other. Um, e-com was the complete opposite. So yes, we were very new to the the entire concept, but everyone's willingness to help made it definitely a lot easier. I love it. Um, so my my uh, thing is, 
why choose Shopify over all the others? That the people you were talking to were just complaining about the Shopify side of things, or was it more like just platform agnostic? Like subscription sucks everywhere at this point. Subscriptions suck everywhere. Um, yeah. the Shopify only had, well, from just a scalability standpoint, the largest audience. And also, honestly, and you know, this isn't to say that we won't expand into other ecosystems down the road, yeah. but um, Shopify is like honestly an inspiration. Like their business model is really mm -hmm. interesting to learn from. So being able to dive into that ecosystem first made sense for a couple of those reasons. Yeah, and and this is uh, and and I've noticed this actually myself, and I, I think uh, Shannon, you could probably touch on like from a marketing perspective is when when I started Taco in 2018, we were you know when platform agnostic were like WooCommerce, Magento, Shopify, like you know let's get all the clients that we can at this point because we're just trying to grow. And I think within the first two to three months, I mean, we had already built our website and everything. First to three, two to three months, we just saw so much influx of like, oh, Shopify this, Shopify that, and I'm like. There's like, like, just like you said, like listening to people and be like, oh, well, it seems like everyone's moving to Shopify. I, th I think, and you guys on the app side probably know this a little bit better. I think for me, the ecosystem that they've created around partnerships and almost like agencies, like you don't feel like, you know, in commercial real estate, everyone's kind of like going at each other here. It's like, Hey, we have an overflow of work. Like, do you guys need work? Do you guys have capacity? Like, it's almost like sharing is caring is a little bit more like spread a amongst everybody, including the app ecosystem and everything like that. And for me, I feel like, and I don't know, have partnerships been a big growth like factor to like your business and, and how people are kind of switching over from other providers over to smarter for their subscription needs? Absolutely. Yeah, I can definitely jump in on that. I couldn't agree more uh, in regards to what you were saying about the Shopify ecosystem. It really is very welcoming. Um, yeah. And partnerships are a huge part of our business model to date, um, and that's across the across the board, across from you know tech partners, agency partners, the whole nine. Um, and honestly, as Gabby mentioned, I've been here for about six months now, and it's one of the first things I started spearheading. It was the first thing that um, you know we really identified as an opportunity in a building brand awareness and acquiring customers. So it's been a huge focus for us, but also. Uh, probably one of the quickest marketing strategies I've ever been a part of. Um, yeah. I think that's to, to your question earlier around like why star in Shopify. I think uh, things marketers do often is like, okay, like what's the whole entire landscape look like, right? Let's get everything on the table and then, you know, find our zones, right? Let's be really, really good at one thing before we start expanding into other things. So um, that's pretty much what we're doing here at Smarter. Um, and yeah, the Shopify ecosystem, there's plenty to do yeah, <laughs> and yeah. plenty to um, you know, optimize for. And as you mentioned, they're constantly evolving. So um, keeping up with that pace uh, sets a good cadence for us as well and uh, a standard, truly. Um, but yeah, the partner space has been absolutely amazing to work with and uh, I think will be a continued strategy going forward um, if yeah. we are top Absolutely. And and what are what are some of the I mean, I guess when you guys first kind of got into the space, like what are some of the pushbacks that you guys got from, you know, partners, for example, to be like, hey, we're already with so and so. Uh, why? Why do we need to switch over? Like what took you guys? What did you guys have to do to get them to be like, no, you know, our system is better and it's going to help your you know customer, your merchant like grow and all these other things. Like what are, what were some of those obstacles? Because I'm sure it's you know, we look at it. Um, a lot of our clients, especially at Taco, like doing 5 million and probably 20, 30 percent, if not more, is re reoccurring revenue. And sometimes the biggest headache, I know in the very beginning, it was like migrating over. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, let me come from, you know, something like bold to here. And it's like, oh, man, there's like a two months just to get all of this over. Make sure you're not double charging people. Make sure, you know, all these other things. So what were some of those obstacles that you guys hit that really kind of like, you know, uh, maybe reality set in a little bit more, but like, oh, wow, we have a really big undertaking here when it comes to this. Yeah. So the one that I thought was going to be the biggest challenge is that there's an obvious major player. Maybe you can name two or three, but there, yeah. there's really one player that has done a phenomenal job of becoming the leader in the space. And I thought the biggest challenge was going to be getting an agency or even an, a, a partner like a brand yeah. to make that switch to a company that just started as inspired right. right very early on um 
what was one of the biggest surprises to me and one of the things that initially when I was doing interviews with the brands, something that stuck out as definitely an appealing element of uh, starting the company was that people were you know, really exhausted of the status quo and yeah. the idea that we could become a disruptor in a space that really <clears throat> at its core is very, it's a basic principle, right? Like mm-hmm. recurring billing is pretty simple if defined in its basic form, but I wanted to innovate in that space and that's what we have been able to do. Um, but so I thought that because of the basic and simplistic nature of subscriptions, it would be challenging to get people to switch. That was, again, one of the best findings, honestly, was how willing people were to switch. And then you totally nailed it. It was the migration. That was the number one question that we got was like, we have 10,000 subscribers. Yeah. How do we that you guys are going to be able to migrate? And that process is no joke. Like when you think about billing, that's the core of someone's business. Oh, man. So while Smarter and subscriptions is just an element of a, you know, a lot of brands, businesses, not necessarily only subscription offerings exist it's still very fundamental to their success. If, if something is not being billed, that, right, that's like literally mm-hmm. money that's being taken out of their pocket. So that is something that we took really seriously. And we spent probably more time perfecting migrations than we did on anything else, frankly. Um, that yeah. was not what we were willing to take. So we spent months testing the process out. There was a lot of learning. We definitely did not figure it out on day one, but now we have... Uh, an automated migration path from any existing provider. And uh, it runs on its own. We have a QA team that manages it to make sure that everything is seamless. Our CS team can do the migrations on their own now. So we don't even require engineering resources at this point. So that was, that's a, that that was exactly it. You nailed it. Yeah. Because I remember one of the biggest nightmare stories was we migrated over somebody and literally, I think it was close to like $150,000 in reoccurring revenue per month that they not only uh, not only double build, but it ended up canceling a bunch of those subscriptions. Like there was some sort of like parameter put in there that it was going to end on a certain date, and that date, like, oh man, it was such a nightmare. And so uh, to me, that was always like the scary part when we talked to her. You know, it's like you can. You, there's a lot of players coming into the game, and they're just like, yeah, it's seamless. It's all this, but it's like, yeah, seamless to a certain extent. Because if you mess up, because people have, you know, there's the prepaid side, there's the one-off side, there's the annual, there's this. There's so many different variations at this point where you know one thing goes wrong. I mean, losing you know an annual subscription of like five hundred dollars. That's that's a lot of money for a business that has margins of maybe fifteen to twenty percent type of thing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So um, I'm glad you guys got that figured out. And I think you put your eggs in the right basket because I think the migration, from an agency perspective at least, it's like the one part that we love telling people that is going to be okay. But if it doesn't go okay, then it almost like lands back on us, and it's just like, oh shit! Like we need to really get this figured out. So um, I just remember being on vacation like three years ago and having to go through a migration, and it was like the timing was so terrible. I was in Croatia, my client was over here, the migration didn't go well, and things just, oh man, it spiraled out of control really quickly. Luckily, we got it fixed, but, you know, so I'm glad you guys you guys did that. But what was, because um, I know you guys have like the whole build-a-box thing and all these other things part of it. What was that unique little factor aside from, you know, prepaid or whatever it is that you guys really focused on as terms of the product on the front end for, you know, a merchant to come in and be like, oh, I can set this up out of the box. Because a lot of the times with these subscription companies, they came in and they said, yeah, we do subscriptions, but it's like, but what if I want to do this? Like, oh, that's going to be custom, go to an agency. So what is that one thing that you guys feel like you nailed from the beginning that you wanted to take care of for, for merchants? Yeah, so great question. Um, And it's kind of twofold. The very beginning was after hearing so many complaints from brands and agencies, it was how do we make an easier subscription app? Why is it so cumbersome? Why are you driving people to agencies for full customized experiences? And why does that take months, years even? Mm -hmm. Can we figure out a way to even just empower agencies to do the process faster? Um, That surprisingly didn't take us as long as we had envisioned. And so Right around probably like last summer, maybe July even, July or August, um, I started to think about how can we further innovate. And the thing that bothered me the most about the subscription space was how A, status quo brands were running subscriptions. And what I mean by that is like, you know, a water company should have a very different business model than a jewelry company, than a Mm -hmm. clothing company, than a 
food snack box company. And I felt like everything was getting clumped together. But the reality of why that was the case was because apps at the time could only do so much, to your point, right? right? So you had to offer a monthly subscription with 10% off and free shipping because that was the only thing you could do. And so that irked me. The other thing that irked me was that brands coming to us, we're asking questions like, how do we remove the cancel button? How do we make sure that no emails or texts are going out to our consumers? We don't want to remind them about their subscription. Oh. Because they were trying to basically, I mean, game it a little bit so that they would return. And that to me also seemed very off. And I had this thought of like, well, what if we did the opposite? What if we engaged the consumer and built with that consumer in mind, making it super flexible for them to do anything, whether it was canceling or whether it was skipping or gifting or editing their subscription box. And that's really where our our big moment started was how do we do things differently and prove to our brands and to all the brands out there that this is a better way to do subscriptions. And that you know was about a year of data collection. We have seen unbelievable results showing why our thesis was right, but that definitely was like the aha moment. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I, I'm, I, oh, yeah. I would just say, um, yeah. I, a, a ton of the narrative in the DTC space for a very long time has been around acquisition, right? Which rightfully yeah. so. It's not easy. It's hard to do. It has, you have to be strategic. It's cost, it's costly. You have to get that right. But I think in what Gabby's thesis proved out is the untapped potential that lives within the post acquisition process, right? Yep. And everything that Smarter has built and is building towards to, to this day um, is with that in mind, right? So it's, it's how do we harness the most potential? How do we really turn your subscription experience into um, a curated journey and a brand experience, right? How are you... Um, taking your most loyal customers, because at the end of the day, that's exactly what your subscribers are, and giving them that VIP treatment and rolling out yep. that red carpet, right? And and that's what Smarter intends to do. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. And I think, uh, you know, it's easy somebody to say, oh, you know, somebody just bought a subscription and now we retain that customer. And it's always, you know, the, the whole like upselling them and keeping them around and what are you doing with the product and all these different things like i think that all goes into now i I feel like the shift is happening now it's not you know one-time purchases were e-commerce for a long long time now it's like subscription people felt like oh i got them on a subscription cool they're going to be here for six months no problems now i feel like it's the tables are turning now it's like okay you could get them to subscribe because everything is subscribe and save now but how do you keep them there? Like exactly. even like my girlfriend, for example, she orders like something like her collagen thing on like Amazon. And she's like, oh, I'll just put it on a subscription. And I was like, you remember when I told you about like the whole like socks thing? And she was like, why would somebody want to get socks every single month? And I'm like, it's it's like the psychological thing that you're after. But now subscriptions have become such a like a norm that I feel like there's going to be another thing where it's like, how do we keep them around for not only three months, not six months, but how do we keep them around for like 18 months type of thing? Like, and, and that, that brings me to my next question is like, what, what sort of life cycles are you guys seeing across different industries for like customers or clients or merchants? Like what sort of like tenure do they have with their, with their customers? Well, honestly, that goes back to what Shannon was just describing is like, what is that wholesale experience? Because frankly, few products and I know as someone working on a subscription app, I probably shouldn't say this, but like few products really warrant full commitment to that one product, right? There's mm-hmm. there's very few examples that I can think of, maybe if any, where I could not find a competitor of that product at my local CVS or Whole Foods. Mm-hmm. And so what you have to do as a brand is is provide other reasons that the consumer should want to remain both a customer, a loyal customer, and ultimately a subscriber. It's not just providing that 10% off because what I actually learned very early on was we had brands coming to us saying, we need to switch off of our our existing app because we have huge churn before the first product is even delivered. Mm -hmm. And they were blaming the app, which ultimately it really wasn't the app's fault. What, whose fault it was, was whoever decided to give such a big discount on subscriptions because I don't blame the consumer. If there's a 25% off discount by subscribing, I'll subscribe and then cancel my subscription before it's exactly. even Exactly. 
So it's a pivot of how you're looking at that journey. It's not just exactly what you said, Z. It's not just getting them to subscribe and click that button, but it's what are you doing? What value are you providing them after? And some products, for example, um, Joe Lee, we work with, they're a shower head company. They do an outstanding job. I'm a big fan. I use their product yeah. daily, literally. Yeah. Um, and their model is genius for subscriptions because you buy the shower head, you have to buy the refills. And basically what it is, is a filtration system for your shower water. I cannot envision a world in which I cancel that subscription. Right, right. I don't want to buy another shower head, nor do I want dirty water. So that is like a very intuitive, easy subscription to manage that to me makes total sense. Whereas, for example, your girlfriend's collagen subscription, I've subscribed to beauty products and then forget to change my subscription frequency because I haven't used up the product or I use it up too quickly. And instead of waiting the five days for my shipment to go out, I go to CVS and buy whatever they have because I need it sooner. So it's about creating that flexibility, the alerts, right? Saying like, Mm -hmm. hey, are you almost completed with your collagen? Do you need more of a supply? It's learning how quickly they're using up that collagen and starting to refresh their memory ahead of that time period. Um, It's rewards. So it's keeping them on the hook where, you know, on the sixth order, you get 50% off. Yeah. So now I'm going to keep my orders coming rather than go to the CVS to buy whatever is available off the shelf. There's so much that goes into it, but it's about transparency, communication, making it easy for someone to manage their subscription um, and creating, again, benefits, member benefits to subscribing. I love that. I love that. Anything to add to that, Shannon? I think Gabby hit the nail on the head. <laughs> yeah. No, that was... That was- I will say brands using Smarter um, are seeing pretty impressive uh, retention rates. Right now, it's minimum 94% on on the Smarter app, which is really impressive. As Gabby mentioned, it's it's very much like a test and learn, right? Each product, each each consumer is different, right? So making sure you're optimizing each journey for them specifically, a curated journey, but also that flexibility allows them to create their own journey, right? And dictate what's most conducive to their own lifestyle and not what a brand's research is saying or what um, we're assuming, right? How, how a, pro- a consumer would be using a product. So I love that. I, I had a, I had an idea around this a while ago. I have it written down somewhere in terms of subscriptions. And I always felt like if I subscribe today and I pay $20, I feel like if, if there was a way, I'm sure there is, if you can make every month that subscription a little bit cheaper as the time goes on. So like if I pay $20 today and let's say your profit margin on that is 30% for the merchant, like I feel like the next month, if it's like even like a dollar less and you keep going down and then maybe it resets again after 12 months where you start paying the original price and then, and you kind of, because I feel like the retention game is so crazy right now with you know, now people are bundling, you know, loyalty, email, text, all these different like components. And I just feel like it's good, but there's a lot of noise. Like it's everybody's at their phones getting text messages. No, I don't want that. I want, you know what I mean? All this other stuff. And I think the the questioning thing that you mentioned, uh, Gabby, about like how many, you know, how many uh, tablets you still have left of your collagen or whatever it is or how many. Like those are the kind of things where it allows you to collect that data and be like, oh, now this person's, you know, it took them two months to go through their first bottle, but now they're like on this more regimented like thing. I think that's really where the, where the real sauce is in terms of like keeping people. Yeah, truly. And another admirable trait that we're seeing in a lot of our clients is honestly having a cause or a mission um, that's tied in. In, and completely embedded with your brand, right? Okay. So for instance, if you want if you want to keep subscribers on and um, keep retention rates high, I'm much more likely to stay with the brand or like let my next order come through if I know that there's a percentage going towards um, a cause that I that is near and dear to my heart, right? Um, so it's actually been absolutely beautiful to work with some of these brands. Um, uh, we were just talking to Righteous Felon. They give back to the Innocence Project and uh, Conservation pro- Projects. Um, Verb D is a, a veteran-owned business and a percentage goes back to veterans. So it's just, a, there's a ton of brands in our space that are um, tying their 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 mission to, to a cause. And I, I think that performs well in this space. 
I love that. I love that. Um, now, uh, in terms of in terms of the marketing stuff, I know partnerships are really, really good for you guys, and and I think for a lot of people. But what are some of the other key like factors that or key like strategies that you guys have used to really grow your product? And I'd love to know, you know, when that turning point for you guys went from like starting the company to like where you just saw like you know the the, the uphill climb at that point. Like, what was that little thing that really helped you guys? Or is it something that compounded over time, obviously, I guess, too? Honestly, it goes back to what I said in the beginning of the call, which is how generous the ecosystem is. I right. totally thought we were the underdogs. No one would want to talk to us. We're like the unpopular new kid that just joined the school. But in reality, be frankly, before we even had a product, we had brands being introduced to us and brands even reaching out saying, hey, I heard of you from X, Y, and Z. And that snowballed, right? Like one person talks about you, then three people come to you, then those three people refer you to five people each. And it was that, it was word of mouth. And still to this day, our number one driver is word of mouth and referrals from brands and agencies and tech partners. So it's been unbelievable to see. It's, I'm not sure how scalable that is from a market. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's definitely heartwarming. And since then, since Jen, Jen has joined, obviously she's done a lot, which she can speak to on more of the scalable long-term um, initiatives that we have more control over because obviously we don't know who's going to be referring us to who. Right. What better way to like feel that reward of starting a company and going through that struggle than seeing people that you didn't know two weeks ago supporting you and helping you grow your business. Um, but I love Shannon, that. feel free to chime in on what you've done. Yes, yes. I agree with everything Gabby said, but I also um, have to say that you and the, the Smart Team have... A, from a personal note, just had all the ingredients, right? And from an outsider looking in prior to joining Smarter, it was very clear. Like, uh, as we mentioned earlier, there was there is a market leader who did a phenomenal job at acquiring market share in the in the beginning of you know subscription time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> However, it's not it's not an unoriginal story, right? So this happens, and then a next generation starts to emerge. And Smarter did a very great job in the beginning of being one of the, the first and most mature of that next generation, right? So I think it was the timing and the positioning of Smarter in itself really helped um, enter the ecosystem and, and, and really start to curate those relationships early on. Um, how scalable is the relationships amongst uh, the ecosystem? Great question, Gabby. Um, I think <laughs> one of the, tech, the tactics that we are absolutely going to move forward with is just truly building a community, right? As a marketer, my my goal at the end of the day is always to provide value, right, to our to the ecosystem, to our prospective customers, and to our clients, right. As we mentioned, it's very clear that this ecosystem is willing to share. Our brands are very willing to talk about how they achieve their goals and their success stories, and honestly, they're really transparent in their vulnerabilities as well. And I think every, you know we can all learn from that. So creating a, a safe space where we can share those vulnerabilities and then really create and harness that and aggregate everything around, um, you know, growing a D2C e-commerce brand specifically in the Shopify ecosystem and being the host of that conversation uh, will prove positive and ultimately scale what seems unscalable. I love that. I love that. Communities are very hard to build, no matter how good your product is, is really, really hard. And I feel like that's been the trend for now, I'd say a couple of years where every um, everyone that's either starting a company or that's seeing like, man, we can't keep spending, you know, tens of thousands of dollars on ads and all these other things. It's like we'd rather reinvest that back into the community and to the people that are actually supporting us, getting that feedback and, you know, really providing that like one-on-one -on -one with them almost. And I think that's, that's super powerful. And I think, I don't think that part of marketing will ever die out in a sense of like how, you know, you saw people, I mean, like, I feel like TikToks and all these things are fucking great, but at some point, like Black it just, <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's gonna, it's gonna take its cycle. There's going to be a new player that comes in, yeah. but like, I think, getting people into one room and that's why you know 
I mean, I just saw Shopify Unite uh, announce yes. their new thing in Toronto and different things. And it's just like, okay, we're back. Because that's never going to go away. They could do all these virtual events. They could do all the slacks, do all of these things. But I feel like when you get people in the same room, get people in that in into that community and people can like share things amongst each other, not just even with you guys, just, you know, having their own conversations on the side. I think that's that's really, really awesome. And so um, but I do want to take it back. How did you guys come up with the name Smarter? Like what was the what was the 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 story behind because I think it's super clever to just have the, you know, that extra R at the end and all this. But what, what was the what was the whole thing behind that, if I may ask you, if there was anything? I mean, so first of all, smarter is kind of a pain in my ass, the name, because half, <laughs> the, people, half the people think it's smart RR. So, and, and I grew up, I mean, I recently got married, but previous to that, my last name was Yitz Hayek. So I grew up never having anyone know how to pronounce my name. And now with smarter, still we get mispronounced. I was like, that's, the, that's like the best name. Now everyone yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it's smarter recurring revenue. It was the was the premise, so it is very clever. I agree. I I love it. I love it. I, I always say I'm like it's like the best part of the company is the name. You gotta have the name. <laughs> You're inspired to build great things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. I love that. I what is the to say yeah. that SEO has really impacted uh, the tech SaaS startup world, <laughs> and just the names that we have are just always all across the board, making sure that it's You're not. betting on people misspelling the word and getting back to your web. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, what, what's what been one of the uh, merchants or uh, uh, that came to your guys' platform and that you that kind of just like blew away? You're just like, whoa, I had no idea that this, you know, brand is doing this or how they've grown so quickly. Or have, has there been any moments where you're just like we we need to do some crazy case study or some sort of like thing around this? Yeah, honestly, I, I wish we were better about proactively looking at all of our brands and their growth. And it more so is like, we'll try the product and then be like, oh my God, shit, this is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Has growth been? So it's kind of backwards, but to the extent that we can proactively do it, of course we, we do. Um, one that came up yesterday that I was so impressed by is Earthling. And uh, they essentially do like eco-friendly products. Um, they were on Recharge. Recharge. Yeah and uh, had been on since early 2020. So they've had a long, long time doing subscriptions. They're an incredibly su successful subscription business, but we launched with them two or three months ago and seeing the chart go from this like kind of growth to this and then literally just like skyrocketing um, when they went on to Smarter to me was honestly just like the best feeling because we took someone's business that was already incredibly successful and an outstanding product and like the most brilliant team and help them hopefully take it to the next level, right? Like hopefully we see that growth trend continue and keep breaking the the limit of, of vertical yeah. uh, growth. <laughs> so that one was really great. Um, also, I just love seeing the businesses that were the underdogs that went into super competitive spaces and killed it. And I can mm -hmm. name I mean, probably hundreds of products that we work with that have done that. Like Sanzo is one of the best sparkling waters I've ever had. And local base started in New York uh, City. I've heard fantastic stories. Sandro is the CEO and he's unbelievable. But I've heard really crazy stories of him like hand delivering the cans early on. And now every time I go into Whole Foods, they have the biggest display, you know. And so seeing seeing brands that took on a really big challenge beverage is probably one of the biggest beverage and, and beauty. So probably. crazy. Um, and thriving in that is always just so incredibly impressive. Yeah, the sparkling water space has amazed me, like Liquid Death and all these like other companies, like just killing it. And and even uh, I think about um, uh, the company Dude Wipes, like Mm -hmm, they yeah. have just completely I saw one of the funniest TikToks the other day and I was like this is why you guys are doing so well like they had this like I don't know it was this like construction guy and he was like you know making fun of it and then he was like "Ooh, this is the best thing ever like you know like this whole and I was just like this is the kind of marketing that makes the company fun and this is you know because everyone's like dude wipes like what the hell but it's it's a real thing you know what I mean it's crazy well, two that you just named. I mean, Liquid Death yeah. and Dude Wipes. No offense, Shannon, but like two of the best marketing teams I've I've seen in a long time. Truly, really, yeah. I mean, uh, props to them because, it, like, again, we talk about being 
uh, built with the end consumer in mind. But those are t- the, they know exactly who their target market is, right? They know exactly yeah. how to talk to them, how to personify them, how to appeal to them in every way um, through creative, through copy, mm-hmm. through just general interaction and touch points. So, um, yeah, I definitely won't shy away from giving them props. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Uh, what are you guys seeing as kind of the next steps for for Smarter? Like, is the next step to go like platform agnostic a little bit more? Is it, you know, are you guys seeing new features that people are requesting and that you're like, okay, we need to add this to the tech stack? Like, what is sort of the 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 next, let's say, three, six, eight months, maybe even a year look like for you guys in terms of growth? Yeah, great question. Um, without spoiling too much, yeah. although we will be the first here. As soon as we're <laughs> um, great question on platform agnostic. I, we kind of touched on this earlier, but for us, it's how do we become the best in where we are, which in this case is Shopify. We want to be the best Shopify app before we go anywhere else. And that is no easy feat. As Shannon said, there's a ton of updates always coming out. There's a ton that we still need to build that I feel and the the entire team feels strong conviction around that we can really make us stand out as the best subscription app. And that's where our time is focused now through the end of the year and into next year is, um, again, without spoiling too much, but you're going to see a lot around memberships and loyalty and really taking that post acquisition phase of someone's customer journey and helping brands uh, reap the most from that experience. And that's both through what we talked about earlier around upsells and, and retention improvements, but it's also what Shannon said, how do we take your most loyal customer, your subscriber, and make them a champion of your brand? That means that they're advocating for you. They're posting on social. They're telling their friends and family to go buy your products. They're gifting your products to people. Um, so that's that's a little teaser of what's to come. I love that. I love that. I think uh, I think there's a lot there, and, and again, it's going into a space where you know there's been loyalty, there's been all these things, but I think when you have it all in one, you know, ecosystem in one, you know, one click almost, where it's like you're in one app doing all of the things that retain to one part of the process. I think that always makes it a little bit more. I mean, even for you guys as the app, right? Like that's the retention piece for you guys that you're passing on the retention piece of the merchant almost like you're like, Hey, we can help you set it up. And then this is going to help them, you know, that sort of thing. And so I think that's a, that's a really, really awesome way of looking at it. And, um, in terms of, uh, uh, the overall team, like how big are you guys right now? How, how quickly have you grown? And are you guys planning on raising more money in the near future? Great question. I think we started the year. I mean, I want to say it was single digits on the team. Um, Now we're over 30 amazing people. Wow. It's like, I can't stress this enough. Like besides the name Smarter being epic. um, (laughs) And and our partnership network, like definitely having such a nice ecosystem and our brands have been amazing. But beyond that and beyond the product that we're building and what we're trying to do with these businesses, like the team that we have brought together is what motivates me every day. It's so humbling for me that such amazing, smart people came to join this company and definitely makes me want to make this as successful as possible, even more so. Um, so yeah, so over 30 people, mostly on R and D, we're definitely heavily invested on engineering and product and fundraising. Yeah. I mean, at some point, of course we will open up the doors. Um, we have a great group of existing investors that have been so supportive. So definitely going to lean on them when that time comes, but it's, it's, you know, it's a full-time job in itself. Yeah, absolutely. Are you guys all in the office? <laughs> yeah, we are in office four days a week. Fridays, we work from home. Um, there's some debates over how many days a week we should be in office. But so far, everyone is on board with four days. It's a crazy, like, two years ago, it was five days a week. There was no question. You couldn't work from home. So yeah. it's honestly sick to see how that's evolved and um to me, the more interesting thing is you assume everyone wants to work from home all the time, but in interviews, we always get the question of like, well, how in office are you? Because we want that experience. And that's yeah. kind of that we've gathered. It's, it's been great for us. Yeah. Awesome. And how, I want to, I want to touch a little bit more on the team side. Like, what are you guys doing? I mean, you know, mental health has obviously been a big topic of conversation for a, a long time, but I think the pandemic kind of really sparked that conversation on a whole different level. Like what sort of team building, team exercises, team things are you guys doing to, you know, talking about retention, retaining your team as well? Cause I mean, there's my girlfriend is in the recruiting world. She does accounting and finance and there's always this now, like, 
oh, this person will pay you more if you go over here and this person will give you more of this and they'll give you three days out of the office. And now it's like this constant push and pull. And so I'd love to know what you guys are doing on your end to keep the team tight, keep them together and keep them you know, focused on the mission of what you guys are looking to do. Yeah. Um, honestly, being in office makes it a lot easier to do that. Yeah. Because we have, I mean, I hope this is true for everyone. I'm looking at the office outside of this room. <laughs> Everyone's in the window like, what are you going to say? <laughs> <laughs> I hope this is true, but like, I really consider everyone on the team a friend. And we have such a good environment where we do team lunches. We, we're nearby a park, a Madison Square Park in New York City. So we'll do team lunches outside. Definitely the summer has made it a lot easier to do things like that. We'll do dinners and uh, we're planning right now, we were taking votes earlier today on whether or not we're going to go to a Mets game or mini golfing. I oh, was, there you go. I was the only one that voted for aquarium. So. <laughs> <laughs> not the move, not the move. <laughs> Everyone was like, do we have to say yes? Because Gabby wants to do it. And I was like, oh God, this is horrible. I feel so old. So I'm like I'm the only one that wants to do the... Should we go to a museum next? Um, but so we definitely try to get out. And like we recently did a day of volunteering where we went and volunteered in the city. Um, we do fr Friday shout outs where everyone gets, you know, to shout out a team member or two based on the contributions that they had this week. So it's you're totally on point. It's so crucial now for people to have good culture. And that's one of my favorite things about the companies that we're able to do that in person. I love that. I love that. Um, anything can, else? Yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. Um, Gabby was actually recently asked this question in an, inter in an interview process, right? And Gabby, I don't know if you remember how no. exactly you answered it, but I thought it was <laughs> And I think truly articulate. So, you know, a lot of times specifically on, you know, podcast interviews and stuff, we want to articulate, yes, we have awesome team bonding experiences and snacks in the kitchen. And yes, we play office DJ all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, not every day is perfect, right? right? There are good days and there are bad days, but the one consistent thread in that is this team, right? So when you're struggling, there's not a doubt in my mind, I can get up, walk across the room and ask a question and someone will be there to support me. I can call Gabby any time of day and she will drop what what she's doing and, and pick up the phone, right? Like, I love that. The team is truly supportive of each other in, in a way like I really haven't seen in a in any really work in any other work environment. So I think we are truly building a culture. I don't know if you can put an actual adjective to it. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's our culture. It's our smarter culture for sure. I love that. I love that. Um, and I can see by your guys' energy that I think it's uh, it's infectious. It's It's really, you know... Um, it's one of those things that, you know, it's always top down, no matter how you flip it, how you try to do it. It's like you, you have to be the person that's leading that sort of culture. And that how, that's how it trickles down. Even on the terrible days, like I said, before we started talking about this, we had a conversation about, you know, uh, the culture and where things are and how things are moving forward. And, and there's, damn, there's terrible days. Like there's days where you just wake up and you have anxiety. Maybe you're launching something, maybe you're doing this. And it's like, when you get to the office, you can almost like just drop your shoulders and be like, ah, everybody's still here. We're going to be all right type of thing. And I think that's really, really important. And I think that's, be that's extremely tough to do with a fully remote team. Um, granted, you have the slacks, you have all these, you know, uh, ways to connect with people, but um, there's something about, you know, feeling people's energies in real life and feeling like, oh yeah, this person's in a good mood. Like, why am I in a shit mood again? You almost forget and you just kind of move over and you say, you know what, we'll be good. Like, and I think that's extremely important. And so um, props to you guys for building such an awesome team and, and an awesome product. And uh, yeah, I think that there's, there's a, there's a huge, huge path forward with with this whole, you know, everything happening within the Shopify ecosystem, the the subscription ecosystem, and um, yeah, I'm I'm really pumped to see all the success you guys are having and and about to have probably a lot more. Ditto, ditto to you and Taco. We love you guys and are so excited <laughs> to be working on more projects. I appreciate it. I awesome. appreciate it. And uh, anything else you guys want to touch on? Anything that I didn't get to that you guys want to talk about, whether it's company related, personal stuff, like anything else that you guys want to touch on um, that, that I kind of slipped over? I think the audience is dying to know what your beard routine is. Truly. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Uh, my routine is make sure you treat it like your hair on the top of your head. Use the conditioner. 
except beard oil. Like I use beard oil and different things like that. But um, yeah, this has been going on now. I think we're in what? We're in 2022. I think I started in 2012. So 10 years. Nice. Um, I obviously trim it. I get it taken care of. But um, yeah, that's been uh, that's been my this is how I built patience, honestly, because the first three weeks of growing a beard is the most terrible time. I'm itchy, no? Yeah, you're just like, your skin is now like doing things. You're like, oh my God, you know, because I was always like five o'clock shadow, just kind of like buzz it down. <laughs> and then one day I went to go get a haircut and the guy's like, you have amazing hair. You should grow out a beard. And I was like, okay. And literally never looked back after that point. And uh, yeah, my girlfriend that I've been with for six and a half years now has not seen me without a beard. So um, it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty in insane. She saw my passport picture from back in the day and she goes, this is what you really look like. <laughs> That's a great point. Does security like believe that it's you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she believed. She believed. But she security security questions me still. They're just like look at it, and they're just like, huh. When we travel, we just went to uh, Mexico at the top of the year, and you know, there's always that second and third look. Can you pronounce your name? What is your birthday? Like that whole thing. And I'm like, you know what, guys, feel free to question me. I'm okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you now. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, yeah. I have a I have a beard comb on my desk at all times yeah, to make sure. You know what I mean? So. <laughs> That was one of my questions was, do you comb the beard? You have to. Yeah, have yeah, to yeah. Do you subscribe yeah. to any beard products? Um, I don't, you know what? I used to be subscribed to them. The problem is that I used to, back in the days, I used to have really, really terrible, like when I was younger, really terrible acne. And I don't know if you guys ever heard of a company called Accutane, uh, yeah. where they, yeah. I had to take that and I've been, my skin's been like, I feel like ruined after yeah. that. Uh, you know, everything else is fine, but I feel like, it just dries out and certain weather changes and different things really, really like, like hit it really hard. So for me, beard oils, like I have, for example, like I have a hair and beard conditioner, like sitting on my thing. Oh, because your desk come cracking yes, up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. So it's like, you literally just spray it on and you just like rub it in and it just like, you know, so there, there's a lot of like maintenance, but you don't think about it. Cause I've been doing it for 10 years. So I'm just like, Oh, this is just part of my thing. Like girls go and do their makeup. Like I go do my beard. Like that's what it comes down to. So it's pretty cool. No, it's sick. Like if I, if I was a brand looking for an agency, I'd be like, this is the guy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, you want to uh, no. So that's really funny that you say that because most people, cause I'm just very like ruthless with my, I'm, I have a sailor's mouth. So I'm like, you know, on client calls, I'm like, fuck this, fuck that. We're not fucking doing, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, people would just be like, damn, your beard really speaks. And I was like, exactly. That's <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, everything, uh, everything with the beard is good. I appreciate you asking that. <laughs> it, it, it really wasn't me. It was the people. <laughs> it was the people. It was the people. Awesome. Well, uh, I really, really appreciate you both being on the podcast. This, uh, I'm, I'm really excited to get this out. I think um, we're probably going to have to do this again in the in the near future to kind of catch up on what you guys have been up to with all the new things coming out. And, you know, uh, you touched on memberships really quickly. That's a very uh, something I've been preaching for like the past three years. And I feel like nobody has really listened, but some people are just kind of starting to get a tickle in their ear. And I'm glad you guys are moving forward with something because I think that space is still untapped. And I think that goes back to community loyalty and all these other things. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing you guys kick more ass. And uh, yeah, I appreciate your guys' time. See you. Likewise. The best. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. You. Absolutely. Appreciate you guys. Well, next time. Until next right. time. Well, you made it to the end of the episode. Thank you so much for tuning into What Is My Brain podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you got some value out of it. Make sure you hit the subscribe button or the follow button to get notified when new episodes are live. I'm out. Thank you.